Welcome back. This is Brighter Morning with Bo, and we have Lester Ori on the line, and we will talk with him this morning about a book he recently published. Do we have him on? Good morning. How are you? I'm good, Doc. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you. Um, good to see you. I haven't seen you since the day your dog bit me. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, well... Um, um, my apologies. Um, oh, that's many, many years ago. So um, I just vaguely remember that I had a dog bite by you. <laughs> but the dog Obviously. is probably gone, eh? Yeah, I would think since so much time has passed, yes, probably. Yes, and he was already old. We were just testing his gum. <laughs> well, I am glad you got away almost scot-free. Um, let me ask you something. Um, tell, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your writing. You have done a lot of writing previous, prior to this. And uh, um, you have lived, a, a, I would say, a rather colorful life. And um, in that also, you have also made from time to time public statements and express your opinion through letters and commentaries, etc., in the press. So let the public understand a little bit who you are and what you are about and what you're doing. Well, Doc, essentially, I'm a writer. And I'm what you will call a full-time writer because I do nothing else other than that. Um, but before that, I had a, another life. I work in the public service and I was a teacher, but then I have become a writer, and um, that occupies and preoccupies my life. Uh, in the process, I have produced about, I think it's about 12 books. I'm not sure. I keep saying 12, but I think more books have come over the years, and I still say 12. Um, you know, 12 is a small number to check, but uh, writers are not into figures and numbers, so we're not exact with the checking. But I have written these 12 books, and um, the intention of all the books was to make it relevant and applicable to people. So even though I wrote novels, and novel writing requires your own imaginative journey into the world, you can still produce something inside there that people can take with them in a practical sense. So that um, my very first book was a dictionary of Hindi names. And uh, there is a definite purpose in that. You know, the, um, people have a new child, and then you go helter skelter looking for a name for that child, a nice name. And among the Hindus, there was always the accusation that well, I don't really want to say the pundits, but the pundits gave them long and unpronounceable names. And, um, and I thought, you know what, why don't I produce a book that has nice esoteric Indian names? So now when I hear names that sound like they came from my book, I said, well, there was, a, there was something positive, a positive outcome of producing a book of Hindi names. And I see, well, times I saw the pundits open their, you know, that red cloth, they have their sacred books. And then I see my book inside there and I said, oh, you see what I have done? I've even made it easy for the pundits and they, to find a name. So if you're looking for V, you get Vandana. And if you're looking for B, because you're looking for the initials that are favorable to your horoscope. Um, so if you're looking for B, you get Boringer that. So, so you, um, and if you're looking for S, well, you get Siddhartha. So that book came in handy um, for a lot of people in this country. I hear names now that I know definitely came out of my book. So I see writing as something interactive. You just don't write and people read it, but they can use it in a more productive, fruitful way. So at, at the back of me there, there is a book of African names. I also did African names, and I also did Muslim names, because I thought we live in this multiracial society. And everybody must have some problem to source a, a palatable name that 
that the child can live with for the rest of their life because it doesn't make sense that parents choose a name or a pundit choose a name and then later on the child is so embarrassed with it and then because of the multiracial nature of the society there is the mispronunciation so so a beautiful name like Parbati <laughs> might be pronounced as Parbati by a, um, a non-Indian person you know and and so we don't so my son is Yudhista and um, when he goes to school some of the teachers will say Yudhishta and Yudhishthir and I told him you know make sure you correct the teachers even if the teachers that is you this star you this star so um so i did the book of indian names and then later on i will do a book um i will do a book a biography of jai ramki soon and i must say that was pioneering sense of a biography really of a businessman here because up till today people don't seem to think that your life matters your life matters and that you you have something to offer society. So I thought Jai, and, and, and I didn't just write Jai on my own initiative. I was commissioned to write biography. Jai thought that he had done well enough to have his legacy um, in written form. And so you see he's gone, but it is here. I just have one copy of the book. and um, But it tells a good story of how somebody came from extreme poverty to become a really a, a, a mega millionaire. That's what he was. He drove the best cars, lived in the best house, you know, and um, it's quite inspirational for people to to read that book and see what you can do with your life. And um, sometimes you wonder why the books are not in, in, in the school curr curriculum rather than we read Cow Jump Over the Moon because see Jai jump over the moon and um, <laughs> he, did, um, he did actually jump over the moon um, and then I did and then I did a book uh, one of my favorite books was Siddhartha written by Herman Hess and then I did, I did a sequel to it because I felt the book remained without a finish whatever happened to Siddhartha's son so I did a sequel to it, but you know, copyright is a, is is a is a hell of a thing in 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 the literary world. So that has remained a kind of private uh, book in my collection. And then I went to Guyana and I did a first. I did a tour guide of Guyana because I found that I needed one to travel through a, a large country like that with so much uh, remote areas. So I did the, uh, the, that book, the tour guide. And, and I must say the tour guide did um, expose me to the president of the United States. Jimmy Carter was there when he saw it. Uh, he asked for a copy. And when he saw it and he went through it, he asked for several copies for his staff and so on and took one of the copies and autographed it and gave it to me. So... Um, that that little book I did on the guy in a tour guide, actually that book turned out to be quite a successful book for me, you know. Um, Guyanese have a little literary sense that I find is more intense than what we have here. So when that book came out, a lot of people got it. And um, one guy in New York, Guyanese guy, Lal Samwaru's Travel Service, yeah. He actually ordered a thousand copies and um, paid for it and everything. So it wasn't a bad um, undertaking at all. And then I would later write another book called Among the Best. Because while I lived there, and um, I, I'm sometimes argumentative, I got into all kind of uh, oral fights with the Guyanese over, you know, you know there was a, a conversation about curry um, curry chicken and chicken curry things like that I petty little arguments I got into arguments with them but I wrote the book and um, lots of people here think that I should republish it because they like it 
they like the writing, they like what I produced, and that um, it gives a better understanding of the Trinidad Guyanese connection and differences. And so I did that, and then I, I did some other things. You know, I can't remember. I did, I did a book on India called uh, India's Gods of Incest. Um, this is a fairly fat book, but it's a novel. And um, although it does, in fact, look, uh, look at um, Trinidad society and Indian society. And, um, and I wrote that book because out of my research over the years, I found that, you know, you hear about India having a rape uh, crisis that is worst in the world, perhaps. And then you look at the Indian Bollywood movies, which show you that they don't even kiss. Two flowers kiss instead of the people. But in reality, uh, Indian society is almost a rape society. And um, I, lots of Indians might not agree with me on that, but the facts are there. And um, so I did that book from a novelist perspective. And uh, I did a book of essays two, three years ago. Um, which I thought was the perfect book of essays because I felt for people to read uh, and really understand reading, a book of essays is always um, helpful because you get a variety of topics. And because essays are two or three pages long, you get encapsulated excellent ideas in a short form. But at the end of the day, it's like you've read a whole book on a topic. So um, I actually have as a topic in the book how to read, because reading actually is an art form. You just don't read to finish. You read and look at the language, look at what the writer is saying. You look at all the, lots of people just read to finish. So you, you look to see the boy gets the girl at the end. And, and for a lot of people, that's the story of a book. But really, the art of reading is, and I, I also point out that if you see any good thing in a book, you underline it, you put a little tick by it. If you see a word that um, you find you didn't quite get the meaning of, well, you just go check it in the dictionary because um, it adds to your vocabulary. And so I did that book of um, uh, essays a few years ago. Um, did did fairly well here, but not well. Um, and now I have done this book, Conversations with an Atheist, which um, is topical because of the current situation we live in. So I um, I started writing this book two years ago, um, simply because of the fire in Australia and the deaths of billions of animals of well a billion a billion animals actually died and um, when that was happening i asked the question that there is there no god to come and interfere to stop to let the rains come and out the fire there and you know there is the view here that when tragedies happen in the world we tend to dismiss it write it off from this perspective it's because of man's sins it's what we do wrong. But then I asked the question, what the koala bears did wrong for a fire that lasted months and just destroyed them? It's, it was an apocalypse actually taking place in Australia. And so that's how the book started. They started from that perspective. And then you begin to look at the religious view on that. You know, in Hinduism, it says, and Lord Vishnu will reincarnate whenever uh, we're having a tragedy and things are dangerous and bad, and he will come and sort it out. But I'm asking the question, but this fire is raging for months and months, and there's no God coming. And, and, and then there's the other view that uh, we have done so much wrong that we provoke the gods into doing this. But then you ask the question, why, uh, why these things uh, happened before man set foot on the world? You know, there were cataclysms and apocalypses before man set foot on the world, that this world was actually one continent 
that experience all kind of geographical and topographical changes, splitting the world into five continents when it was essentially one continent. So these things were happening before the emergence of man, before we, uh, we were here. So it was not attributable to sins. It is mother nature at work. So when you get flood, it is not because uh, Hitler killed all these Jews, but Mother Nature somehow is somehow acts on its own initiative, and um, I am probably rambling and not giving you a chance though. But uh, that's essentially me, and um, the book itself is it takes a long journey. The protagonist in the book, Govinda, travels a journey that um, makes him an atheist at the end, but he's an atheist from the point of view of science. Now, the thing about the word atheist in a country like ours, it is, it is associated with the most negative things. People tend to think that uh, atheist or atheism is connected with or human sacrifice, which is the furthest from the truth. Atheism gives you a scientific intellectual view of our existential reality in this world and metaphysical too, how the world came into existence. So we do not understand the Big Bang theory and its importance in, in global existence or in cosmic existence. We tend to think that um, if you are an atheist, well, God will strike you down. But um, uh, lots of people are atheists in the world who have come to realize in fact, what we should simply look at is that we have a COVID situation here, a pandemic that is two years and more going now, and praying is not helping, you know. The only thing we need to pray to is Pfizer come up with something stronger, which is still the scientific basis for all the things we do. I come to believe, without people accepting this, that we might all be atheists from the sense that when we are sick, we don't go to the church and we don't call the priest to come and do, perform some exorcism, Hindu's jari. Which you know what? We head for the hospital and the first doctor we see, we um we begin to say, uh, well, here is help and here is the possibility of getting better. But um, but we really don't run for the um the Bible or we really we come back home, get the smartphone and Google what is a home remedy for it. And the home remedy tells you you need to use aloes or something, some bush medicine. But um, you don't just drop on your knees and pray because subconsciously, unconsciously, subliminally, you know that at the end of the day, you have to do it yourself. And you have to depend on the scientific option that is available. So you get sick, you go to the doctor, you, you go to the priest, and he too went to the doctor yesterday because he wasn't feeling well too. Because he knows that the Holy Word is, might have a lot of holes in the Holy Word. So he doesn't um, believe essentially on, on the Bhagavad Gita or the, or the Holy Bible and so on. We have, we have so much reasons to consider the scientific position as perhaps the main option in our existence. We, we can't... Uh, we, if we, you know, you look at, you look at the whole cosmic picture, and there are billions and millions, billions and trillions of stars out there, galaxies, outside of the Milky Way. This is ours. The Milky Way is ours. There are billion. You know, we don't use thousands and millions when we're calculating the planetary uh, uh, enterprise. It's always in billions and trillions and billions and trillions. So out there, there are so many billions and trillions of stars where this Earth could fit into one of those stars like billions and trillions of times. We are just a small dot in the global picture, a, a, a ballpoint dot, you know, because, um, you know, it, it, in the Ramayana, I think Lord Hanuman swallows the... Um, the sun. Why the place didn't get dark and 
and whether that makes sense at all the, somebody swallowing the sun really sounds like a comic book uh nancy story right well if you just write that into a into a book you're trying to um prove that he was so powerful and so on but the thing is when that happened nobody knew at that point that there were trillion suns in our milky way there were so many suns so if he swallowed one well it still had a trillion you know so um that in itself you know makes makes those stories uh kind of farcical and trivial and um we've taken things we've taken things and accepted them without even beginning to understand that the unexamined life as the greek said is not worth living yeah well okay uh, well, that's that's a good point i think we just have a few minutes now um you said you were rambling i allowed you to ramble because it was a purposeful rambling because you were explaining how you came to write these books what prompted you how they did and how you ended up here where you are and i hear you to say really that you know within in, within you as captured in this book there is a battle between religion as not giving a sufficient understanding of how the world works and of man's place in it and science giving you another opportunity to make the world work on the basis of rationality reason and scientific discovery i mean and there is that sense of battle in this particular book which you call a novel but it really is a contention of ideas um is that is that what has prompted you as a writer uh to leave teaching because of your need for inquiry and to investigate and to read and to write etc uh I I had no idea in the early days that I was heading towards a writing career but in my younger days teenage years and I'm reading whenever I'm reading I'm underlining what what took my fancy uh fanciful phrases words that were beyond me and I would jot them down in a notebook and just leave them there because I found when I underlined things um it became etched in my memory even if i didn't open back that notebook never it seemed like in i had the notebook in my head as well so um it seemed like i was heading to to was a writing career unknown to me so that when i started writing i had all this material i was like i i i do i kind of not humbly say i was the first walking um internet in town because i seemed to have so much information that i read everything I tell my friend in joke I read the whole library in Alexandria already so all right so we've got to be, we've come to the end so we've got to close and I just want to ask yes. you this final question so do you spend all your time now reading and writing and publishing the books that you create so your career is one of writing and producing books is that correct Yeah that's essentially the truth except that now I hardly read I find I I I no longer get fascinated with the novels and so on I read all so many of the great writers and that um to read a novel now you draw it's a little bit trying stock. you draw on the stocks that you have built yes Is I think I have a good stockpile a literary stockpile there that I can just reach out because I don't do research anymore. I don't check the dictionary. I might be a kind of a walking dictionary. You know, they say the 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 literary dinosaur is a thesaurus. Well, I might be that. All right. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Lester, Siddhartha, Ori, for being my guest this morning and for uh, basically doing a stream of consciousness. uh explanation and exposition of 
how you have lived your life, how you have worked, uh, how the books that you have written came about, and how you ended up with this book, Conversation with an Atheist. Would you, as my final question, is the yes or no answer, describe yourself as an atheist? Um, via Govinda's journey in the book, I seem to have had it that way. Okay. And um, I'm not the atheist from a religious perspective or being um, an unbeliever, but from a scientific perspective, that right. science explains me. Then. Thank you very much, Mr. Ori, for being my guest this morning. This is Brighter Morning with Bo. We've been talking to Lester Siddhartha Ori, who just wrote a book, Conversations with an Atheist, and he has written, according to him, about 12 different books of different kinds, being a curious man, and we were glad to talk with him. Uh, see you next week. Next week. We will only have three, three days of this show on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then I close up the show um, on the 15th uh, for the year. Uh, take care. This is Brighter Morning with Bo. We go to the 8 o'clock news with Andrew Chan.